Great. Thanks. I'm excited about the topic today and basically taking an approach to really securing your data and protecting it from any sort of threat, some strategies you can employ, some misconceptions that have been going around, I think, because of marketing and, and other uh, knowledge that's being shared, and then some preparatory steps you can take uh, at the end of the webinar. So, so uh, as Laura mentioned, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Ractop. I have over 25 years of experience working within the intelligence community and shaping uh, how they manage their infrastructure and have a strong understanding of how nation states go about offensive cyber operations. And so that knowledge has allowed me to, you know, found Racktop to enable any organization to protect their data as if it were a national secret. So we're going to talk about how that experience has played in and how adversaries are stealing data, whether they're a nation state or an insider or a, you know, hacker type uh, criminal gang. And so I've got really a three point data security strategy that I want to share with you, right? A lot of people talk about cyber and cyber is a pretty wide topic, but really the bad guys are after your data. They're stealing your data. They're not stealing your network or your computer physically. They're stealing your data. And so what you need to do is focus on the data and the attack vectors they're using to get to the data because everything there else they're doing, all the things you're looking at, all the things you're trying to detect are all ways that they're trying to steal or destroy your data for either intellectual property purposes or for financial gain. And then you need to choose an, an employee strategy for your data security that's going to be manageable for your organization, right? It's got to be something that allows you to operate that you can manage with the staff or service provider you have, and that can continue to evolve too, right? I think a lot of people get stuck and say, hey, we did that and we're going to just you know, stay complacent. But with cyber, it's very different than anything else. The adversary is evolving over time. They're always looking for a new way or a new angle to attack you and to get the data they're interested in, in stealing or holding you ransom for something like uh, like a ransomware attack where they're typically now re resorting to evolve, to extortionware. So their tactics evolve. So your strategy and tactics must evolve as the technologies you change uh, or the technologies you employ change, as well as, you know, different uh, adversaries come up with different methods of stealing and destroying your data. And so I took the 2023 IBM cost of a data breach report and we, we created this, this slide. And you can see the, the damage done as you go higher and, you know, the cost to the organization for the different types of attack, and then the probability or frequency those type of attacks are used for the initial attack vector, right? This is all about the initial attack vector. You may end up using uh, multiple attacks in a cyber attack to steal data and chain those together, but you can see phishing is very damaging in, in terms of cost, and it's also used very frequently, followed by stolen uh, compromised or compromised credentials, right? It's very uh, easy in a lot of cases for uh, adversaries to get access to a compromised credential or a weak password or to guess a password. Uh, not all systems have things like multi-factor authentication implemented on them. You might have it in your organization, but maybe it's not tied to everything. They just need to find one way to get in. And if they can get admin type credentials, well, those are very valuable and those can be used to do other things to prevent or to create other accesses for them um, that they may desire. The other thing is, is zero days. You kind of see that in the middle of the frequency and, and towards the top of the, of the damage done. So unknown zero days are what, you know, nation states and a hacker is considers gold and they've been on the rise. So we went from 15 zero days in total known to, known to the uh, world in 2020. Uh, two to 100 in 2023. We're seeing a widespread of zero days. So they're not just creating zero days against the very big uh, companies and brands, but less known brands. It's very widespread. And in fact, China, you know, went from having only a few uh, zero days in their history to having 12 last year and being the leaders in creating zero days. So if you can create a zero day, you have the ability to go and attack things without people knowing that hey, they're exposed. And so you can do a lot of things. And when you have something like a zero day, you're going to try to prevent um, people from noticing that you're using it. So you're going to stay quiet. And these are things you're going to use to be stealing data typically, right? You want to go unnoticed and you want to have the ability to create access so you can get back in there uh, whenever you, you need to. 
Um, obviously, misconfigurations, cloud misconfigurations, any type of misconfiguration uh, can be a big challenge when it comes to cybersecurity and data loss. Social engineering, you know, is very popular when it comes to, you know, stealing uh, data by getting people to do things they shouldn't do or normally shouldn't do and can be hard to deal with because, you know, hackers are getting better at, uh, at their techniques and they're using English uh, speakers, right? Native English speakers. Traditionally, a lot of times hackers against US companies and organizations might be foreign, a little easier to detect there might be something going on, but now they're using social engineering against your help desk. Help desks are inclined to help you. That's their whole point. And so you get the right person on the right day, you might be able to get them to do things they shouldn't do to help thinking they're helping an employee or an important manager or something. And that's the one gateway in. And then once they're in, they're in. So you'll you'll see attacks with that. And then the malicious insider, we'll talk about that too. Obviously, that can go on without you knowing. It's very difficult to detect an insider threat because they're doing things um, that a normal employee might do, right? And if you think about it, what uh, an adversary really wants to be able to do, what the, the most sophisticated hackers want to be able to do is doing what they call living off the land, stuff your employees would do. So an external attacker is trying to look like an insider. An insider already is an insider. So it becomes very difficult to detect those types of behaviors and patterns. So we're going to talk about how that could be uh, potentially done. And then we still see, you know, a lot of known unpatched vulnerabilities get exploited to be used uh, in these environments to, to get data there. And we're also seeing that, you know, if you're using mobile devices, if you're using a laptop, if you're working from home, a lot of times those devices are exploited outside of the office location or in some other uh, facility. So where it's easier to get to that device or there might be a better way to, to get to that. And then like business email compromise, you know, the latest trick there is that they're sending you an email and then you're, you're scanning a QR code with um, your mobile phone. Well, your mobile phone's not on the corporate network, so it's just on your regular telephone network. It's not being blocked by any of those corporate uh, firewalls or anything like that. And the next thing you know, you've done something damaging, either downloading malware or done something um, to start that initial chain of the attack. And so what I thought was very interesting is that only 33% of attacks are identified by team security tools. They're not catching these things. In fact, a lot of times, the, the attack is caught by a third party, not even your organization. And that was because, you know, their data got compromised and it was found elsewhere. What we're seeing now though, is with ransomware attacks or extortionware attacks, we finally raised past 50% and about 54% of organizations were the ones that recognized the attack. But that's really because they got harassed or contacted by the ransomware gang saying, hey, you've been hacked. And that's how they would have been notified versus if, their data being found out on the dark web uh, someplace like that. And so really what we need to do is really move towards an environment where we assume breach. And, and we're going to talk about that kind of zero trust approach. And so what I specifically want to talk about when we talk about a data security strategy too, is where is cyber storage able to either offer full protection or supporting protection, right? So um, you'll see that, you know, stolen credentials was huge in the impact, right? Almost 4.62 million per event and also a very high frequency rate. And it also had the longest time to detect on, on average 11 months. So that's a long time where they're using stolen credentials to do what they want before they go detected. And why is that? Because stolen credentials or compromised credentials, that person looks like a normal employee in a lot of cases, especially if you don't have the the visibility and logging and auditing to see what's normal and what's not normal. It's the same challenge you have with the malicious insider. So what you really need to do is have clear evidence and visibility and auditing into how that user is accessing files, what, what they're doing that's not normal. Are they above and beyond uh, what, what things are going on and things like that. It can help with phishing because if phishing is used as an initial attack vector, but, the, but the then get those stolen or compromised credentials, you're back to being able to audit uh, what's going on. And then, of course, you're going to have those unknown zero days. So they get into some device, and then once they're on that device, they will move laterally and try to go steal data, right? When they steal that data, if you're putting those protections around the data itself with something like cyber storage, you're still able to detect and, and stop that unauthorized access and that data breach in that way. Obviously, social engineering, it can support that too, right? It can, it can see when people are doing things 
and moving from what the normal behavior is to not by getting people to do things uh, they shouldn't do. Um, it can also give you an audit in that accidental loss to see like, hey, what's happening? All of a sudden we see kind of an abnormal pattern of what's going on. And of course the malicious insider, whether they're using admin credentials or doing other things that go outside the norms, you know, something like cyber storage is a very good uh, line of defense to protect your data against that insider threat, as well as those unpatched uh, vulnerabilities, right? If, if, a, if a machine becomes compromised, they use that machine to then go get data off the NAS and things like that, you're gonna know right away because you're gonna see that that machine that doesn't normally access data is now all of a sudden being used uh, to steal or exfiltrate data from your environment. And then physical security compromise. A lot of people, you know, I think aren't aren't thinking about the physical aspects that, hey, a thief, just like they go in and steal money or furniture or equipment, could come in and actually, you know, compromise your device. They could put a key logger on there. They could do things when you're not in the office and present or put cameras in there to then see what's happening so that they can use that to then um, gain access to your environment. So all those things that would change, those initial attack vectors really lead to the, the attacker going and trying to steal data. And so you want to put those protections as close to the data as possible. And with BrickStore and a cyber storage solution, you can be that last line of defense to protect that data against uh, malicious actors that are either trying to destroy it or trying to steal it uh, and not let you know. And so now is cyber storage the only solution to do this? No, it's, it's something that you want to use potentially in conjunction with the rest of your suite, right? You still want to have things like email security for business email compromise. You still want to have DLP for things as well. You want to have um, MDR, right? You want to have managed detection response on your endpoints. You still want to protect your endpoints. You want to contain malicious activities as close to the source of that malicious activity as possible. Just like we want to put the protections as close to the data where it lives, you also want to do the same thing for other devices and other parts of the infrastructure um, in your environment. But when it comes to data security, it's all about preventing the unauthorized access of the data. It's not about restoring from backups or any of that stuff. It's about preventing someone from getting access to data they shouldn't have the privilege to, to read or, or access or do anything with. And so kind of show this as how you can look at that comprehensive suite of solutions uh, to do that as well. And so, um, you know, talking through it, if you think about the different types of data breaches, in 2024, last month, right, or actually this month, Dell had a data breach where all the customer information um, was was stolen. And they did that through guessing the password and stole basically what you call stolen or compromised credentials. They brute force attacked the database to be able to get um, access to all of the users and customer information, essentially, right? So what's that mean? Well, what's at stake in this case is now they know all of Dell's customers and their technology suite. So now maybe what they got from Dell directly is not that valuable or, or a lot in people's minds to start with, but really what it means is that now they know who's customers of Dell. Now they know what your technology landscape looks like. So they can use that information to stage attacks in their customer environment. So if they know, hey, customer XYZ uses Dell PowerScale and it's has all these CVs that we know about, and we know that they're on this system and version, well, we know what we can use to basically go after them. And we also know who the people are that manage that. So we can also use our social engineering potentially to go get information about accounts for that machine. Or maybe we're gonna go talk to the help desk and pretend to be that person to get them to do something like reset our password or change our password. So all that information can be used to chain together to then go attack Dell's customers. So. These are the concerns that you can have with, with a situation like that. And then if you remember back to September, the MGM casino breach, right? There was a ransomware attack against the MGM as well as Caesars around the same time. So basically they exploited an unknown uh, zero day vulnerability in Okta, use that to get super admin credentials and then start doing basically a voice phishing uh, exercise to then get more access. So they kind of chain that together like that, right? The attack started on September 8th. The gang stealing information on the 9th um, and, and getting customer information about uh, MGM's customers. They're getting logins and passwords for MGM systems. And the casino decides on September 10th, hey, things are bad. We need to shut this down. They start to power stuff off and turn things and have a response that essentially 
renders the, the casino inoperable. People aren't able to check into their hotel. It's, it's, it's a big disaster. It wasn't actually until September 11th, so after MGM's already shut stuff down, that the hackers launched the ransomware attack against their ESXi host and then demand a ransom and, and try to get money for extortion in the ransomware attack. So you can see that these things start in, in a way that people don't expect and they're in there. And the first thing all these people are doing is either is stealing data, right? They're trying to steal data for either extortion purposes or to steal that intellectual property for use of something else. And so Sunburst, if you go further back in 2020, was a very sophisticated attack that basically created a zero day vulnerability, right? They went in and got into SolarWinds supply chain for their software, put malicious software in there so that it would get updated as part of the or network monitoring software, the Orion network monitoring, so that when people deployed that in their environment, it would beacon out to the command and control location and say, hey, do you want to get access to this network, right? So it's a very sophisticated attack where this software was deployed for eight months before it was detected by Palo Alto. So they had access to people's network for eight months, the ability to steal data and create persistence in those environments. And the challenge is after people realized they had deployed the software, they had no visibility based on the way their infrastructure was set up to go back and look to see, hey, yeah, I deployed the software. What was compromised or what was stolen? Did anyone actually try to steal that data? Because the logging and visibility did not exist within their infrastructure to look at you know, what data is being accessed on a continuous basis. And you go back even further to Edward Snowden, right? A very famous uh, insider threat, right? Malicious insider decides they're going to try to get data and expose that to the public. So they're using all sorts of accounts and things like that. It's a, the most difficult threat to detect because they are an, a, a privileged user that has access and is supposed to be accessing data. So to detect an insider threat, you need to have full visibility into file and user activity monitoring at a very detailed level. So you can know this is what looks like normal and this is what's different so that you know when things start to change so you can analyze those changes in behavior. And you need automated responses too because you need to be able to stop or alert on those changes in behavior. You can't rely on a user to go in and look and review that because it doesn't happen fast enough. And those users can be pressured by social pressures like, oh, he's probably doing things that's fine. I know him, he seems normal. You need those automated responses that trigger like, hey, these are different and then make that person justify, why are you doing that? What's the business reason for doing that? And, and having those alerts and, and multi-step processes where multiple people are notified will create that environment that it'll stop or hopefully prevent the insider threat uh, from occurring. So some, some misconceptions that I've seen a lot uh, lately, you know, in case you missed it in those things, I showed data backup as being a solution, right? Backups and immutable snapshots do not protect you against data. I, I hear every backup vendor saying they're going to protect you from ransomware. They're not protecting you from ransomware. They're providing a restoration after the attack, potentially, after all your data has been stolen and your data has been encrypted. That's not where you want to be. You want to prevent the attack and you want to prevent them from ever stealing your data. Almost every data storage solution these days has immutable snapshots and they've had it for a long time. It hasn't stopped ransomware attacks. It's offered a way to recover. It gives you versions to recover files from, and we have a cool story around that, but it doesn't do anything to stop them from stealing the data. And that's the threat that you really got to worry about. The hardest thing to detect is that insider threat. The hardest thing of any type of you know data security threat is data theft. It's not changing or manipulation of data that's hard to detect. It's hard to detect data theft because those are basically like read and open type operations. And so, you know, these are my top eight uh, misconceptions. The backups aren't going to save you from a ransomware attack. All they're going to do is provide you a recovery solution, and it's going to be slow. You want a, an approach that's much more uh, resilient and a, and a faster recovery. Third-party audit tools that you see out there from like, you know, the Veronis's or the Netrix's or Saperna's, they don't get enough information fast enough, and they don't have enough fidelity about what's going on to be effective. They give you insight way too late and they don't have enough information to give you those decisions without creating a lot of false positives. And when you have a lot of false positives, you dial down the sensitivity and then now the, the hackers get through it. A lot of people think their endpoint solutions like CrowdStrike are gonna protect data theft and protect them from everything. That's not the case. The, those tools have their place, MDR has their place, and it's very specific around protecting the endpoint from malicious processes from malware. 
an adversary is going to try to sidestep those endpoints and get out of the device like your multi-factor or your you know multi-function printer or something else to use that to exploit that to then go get access to your data. So they'll sidestep those endpoints or disable them. Um, a lot of people think hackers are just some kids in the in the basement. They're actually typically very highly educated, highly trained people. They could be the equivalent of like the US NSA or they could be, you know, the Chinese equivalent of that, something like that, or very sophisticated uh, computer scientists that have a reason to do that. So you, you shouldn't underestimate their ability or their willingness or the money behind them to, to get to their means. And then a lot of people just think they're not a big enough target. Nobody cares about my data. But in reality, you might have little piece of information that are worth a lot of money. Like you might be in your email, have information about what deals are going uh, to happen about a business transaction. That could be valuable to somebody that's competing uh, in that space. And so you may just be a factor, or maybe it's like with Dell, where I just want that customer data set so that I can use that to then go exploit their customers and things like that, that have a lot of interesting information that is of value to me. Um, a lot of people think all their sensitive data is in the databases. That's where the patient records are. That's where the credit cards are. Unfortunately, a lot of times people are exporting the contents of that data out into spreadsheets and other things that exist in unstructured data. Also, people save their one-time password keys on their file share. So sophisticated hackers will go in and go steal that one-time password you know, key set or pre, you know, predefined keys and use that to then get into multi-factor authentication on other systems. So there's the reasons why you have to protect all the data. And as I mentioned, the attack doesn't have to start at the work or the office. They may gain access to your device while you're working on your home network or you're, you know, out at Starbucks or things like that as well. And a lot of people kind of ignore the fact that somebody may go and get physical access to your device or to your, to your, uh, office environment. It, it's not it's not unreasonable for them to try to do that or interdict a supply chain to swap something, some hardware out within your, your stuff when you go to buy it. So attacks can be phased and long. You know, the more there is the gain, the more they'll they'll resources they'll employ to get it, right? They're going to look at the technologies you use. They're going to go after the accounts. They're going to look for those accounts on the dark web. They're going to see what logins you use. They're going to look at the employees there, see if they can impersonate employees. They're going to see who's vulnerable. They're going to look at who your partners are. To get to your data, right, they might go through your third-party partners or somewhere in your supply chain that's vulnerable or weak. We see that often. Um, and so you have to look at it holistically in that case as well. And they'll, you, they'll leverage that previous success getting information or successful attack in one location or with one partner to, to move laterally to get to another partner or another part of the environment. And they'll look for ways to create persistence so that once they do go get detected and you might remediate one issue, they may still exist within your infrastructure someplace else. And so you have to always assume you're breached. And so what people are really looking to do is implement a zero trust strategy where you assume breach. And so one model I like to show is the CISA zero trust maturity model talks about constant trust evaluation when you think about zero trust. You're always evaluating trust. So every time somebody's doing something that inter interacts with an enterprise resource, a machine, a document, a database, you're evaluating trust to say, do I want to allow that to happen? Should this user and this device be trusted and allowed to perform this, this action and, and uh, operation with this enterprise resource? And you need to look at it holistically. You can't just choose, oh, I'm going to do identity or I'm going to just do a device with MDR. You have to really cover all five pillars because the adversary just has to find the one gap, the one weak chain or you know vulnerability you have to get in. Because once they're in, then they can start to move laterally and do things. And so a lot of people aren't thinking about the data. But if you really think about it, back to my number one strategy is focus on the data and the attack vectors to get to stealing your data and it simplifies the problem. You'll see that you'll still implement those other four things, but a lot of people aren't focusing on the data first, which is the gold, right? If that's what you want to protect, that's where your focus should be. And you need to have that visibility, right? You need to know historically what happened and what's happening in real time. You want to tie it into the automation orchestration, and it's got to tie into your, your policies and regulations. And as always, security is a layered approach. You have to assume that you know one of these functions or features could inevitably even not just fail, but it could become your vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen vulnerabilities in tools like Okta, right? Okta gets, has a vulnerability. It's meant to be your multi-factor identity, but if it's the problem, well, then you need to rely on something else to detect that, uh, that vulnerability exploitation as well. So a little bit more on cyber storage. 
So traditional NAS systems really didn't have security built into them. They have access controls, but beyond that, they didn't really offer anything. People started to offer things like encryption, but that's very limited. Really what you need is, is that ability to monitor what's going on and understand what's normal and to evaluate trust for each file operation, not just send that audit log off to some other tool that analyzes it when it gets to it and tells you something's bad. You want to build those capabilities into the system itself and employ that zero trust decision-making at the storage control itself, as well as do that long-term analysis to understand what's normal for this user or this type of group, or if somebody's accessing data from a place they don't normally come from or a time of day they don't normally come from, you can at least alert on it or even block it depending on the severity and risk profile of your organization and the data. And so the, the six things you should look at in a cyber storage uh, solution, those key features are zero trust, zero trust data access we've talked about, real-time proactive security, that real-time enforcement and detection of malicious behavior for data theft, ransomware too, but data theft or insider threat. That, that's the hardest thing to do, but it's also the most critical because before they ever launch that ransomware, the first thing they're doing is stealing data. That's when you want to detect that you have suspicious or malicious activity on your environment. You want to have built-in incident management so you can quickly understand what's happening, communicate what's happening, and recover very quickly. And you need that real-time and historical visibility. And yes, do you want immutable and indelible data? You want those snapshots? Yes, but that's only one component of cyber storage. And it's probably the component that most people have. What they lack in their what they call a cyber storage solution are these other five areas. And then you want that security posture monitoring. You want to be able to do you know, detect when things aren't configured correctly. You want to be ideally postured. You want to reduce your risk and improve your cyber hygiene. And if you do it right, these are those outcomes you're getting, right? You're going to stop that attack before it really happens, before they steal you all your data. You're going to create cyber resiliency. You're going to block the bad and malicious actors, but allow the good users to continue to operate. You're not going to shut everything down like MGM or like the the, the pipeline did, right? You want that rapid detection and that rapid remediation to pre-attack uh, state. And you want to be able to demonstrate continuous compliance with your policies and regulations. You have all these security controls in place. Being able to demonstrate it makes it easy to show auditors and stakeholders that, yeah, we're doing the right thing and, and how it's going. And you quickly want to spot those misconfigurations. This goes to that that policy for, or sorry, that security posture, right? Eliminating misconfigurations eliminates a huge attack vector we saw as well. And of course you want that visibility of what's happening in the environment at any time. So you know, if something bad happened, you can go and investigate and look back to see what was done, what was compromised, who did what, and, and attribute that as well. And so what should you do as your kind of next steps? You know, you should leverage things like the NIST cybersecurity framework. They just posted a new 2.0 model. I think it's very good. It's more of guidance for how to do things versus like prescriptive or like a requirement. And it can be a useful tool for looking at your security posture. The CISA Zero Trust Maturity model is a pretty short document and would take less than 15 minutes to read. I think it's worth reading that so you can understand um, what's going on. And then you should review, review what technologies and tools you're using to meet these requirements and compare it to the attack vectors we showed today. Do you have things that are gonna stop those different attacks based on the way you've set up your environment? And then go through a tabletop exercise for an example and see how it works. Does it act, uh, you know, do you have the, the outcome you expected or are there challenges? And I think the biggest takeaway is, you know, things are evolving quickly. You may have made a decision that was right at the time for the time, but you shouldn't let that hinder you from changing or pivoting based on new information or the availability of new technologies like cyber storage, something that's only been around for a few years as a, as a, as a product type that you can consume wasn't available you know, in 2015. So decisions you made then would have been one thing. Now knowing these tools that are available and new threats and how things are operating and maybe your risk profile has changed, you need to reevaluate those decisions at least annually, if not more frequently. And so don't let a previous decision embarrass you from making a change that can be the right thing for your organization um, as well. So I hope uh, you found it valuable. I appreciate uh, your time. And uh, if, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. This session will be available on demand. We'll follow up by email and can also share a copy of the deck with you. Thanks.